Welcome to What Is It About the Weather Podcast, where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and this week, this week we're going to dig into EV weather. You probably didn't know there was such a thing. Well, we'll talk about why in just a bit, but in the meantime, as always, I hope your weather's going well. I've had definitely some yo-yo weather. I was out doing some errands early yesterday morning. And it was chilly. I mean, you know, it, I guess it's all relative, but, you know, it was, I don't know, in the range of 15 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit so uh, a little, you know, 10 to 12-ish on the negative Celsius scale. I know everybody's got their own thing, so I do try to give both. But by the afternoon, it was almost a freezing. Now, you may not say that's yo-yo weather, but what was interesting, or the way you really kind of feel it where I live, is... It gets really warm because I got this big window that creates kind of a greenhouse effect where I have my desk set up, right? So during the day, I may go from very cold, even if we have the heat on. And we, you know, at night, we we turn it down a fair amount. That's what blankets are for, right? And during the day, though, with that sun coming in, it can get pretty toasty. So when it gets toasty, you open the windows a little bit. But I was struck by... The variance just between my feet and my head, temperature-wise. So open the window, and almost immediately you could feel that cold air, which sank to the lowest levels, right, just rushing towards my feet. But we're also supposed to expect rain and mild temperatures. Last weekend I had mild. You know, it's as I talked about going out and doing a hike, it was, you know, just it's just been this back and forth. So a little bit of yo-yo weather, but I, you know, I like that. As you guys know, I like that variance. I like that shift in that change. I'd like a little more snow since it is winter time, but I'll take what I can get and, and move along. I guess what's really caught my attention in the last few days, oddly enough, has been car advertisements. Now the first one has nothing to do, nothing to do with today's episode at all. But it was interesting because it was very local to me, and I thought I'd share it. There, no, there is weather in it. There's a nice shot at the end, and that's actually what caught my attention. There's a nice shot with a bridge, and I think it's a Mercedes ad. It's I think there was a gender reveal party for a, a baby that was coming, and this couple had been there, right? And he got a little bit of blue, baby blue dye on his white tennis shoes, and he's and yeah, it, it's comical, right? He's upset that it's, it's kind of ruined his shoes. But then they pan away over to his wife, who's driving, and she's got this blue dye just all half for her face, this nice white dress that she has on. But what caught me with this ad is it seems like they're driving home from this party, right? And where they pulled off in this shot, I'm like, I, I recognize that. And so I was looking through some of my pictures, and it is. It's a park not too far from me. That's The picture is of the George Washington Bridge, which connects New Jersey with you know, kind of the northern end of, of Manhattan Island. But it's a park I've hiked in before, and it's probably even one I've mentioned. It, it's a it, part of a park where I do some of my bike rides and whatnot. So I've probably you know brought it up even a couple times in the podcast in the past. And I even looked at the, I rewatched the ad and they did film more parts of it in the park. But what hit me is this is just not a park you would go to on your way home. So yes, it sets up a nice scene and yes, it's good for the commercial, but no, it's not just some random down the road thing that they happen to catch. But what did catch my attention also in last week's Super Bowl was the number of, now there's always a vehicle ads and and you know in generally speaking I don't know if there were more or less vehicle ads but a lot of them were about EVs or electric vehicles and there was even this one with Arnold Schwarzenegger I think he's playing Zeus I don't I I, I think that's the role he's supposed to be in but he gets frustrated about you know using his electrical powers and you know ends up in an EV but there were just a lot of them you know some new brands like Polestar which is an EV you know only brand some more traditional things and I just caught my attention, and you see this sometimes in the Super Bowls, right, where themes catch on. And this, to me, this theme was pretty persistent throughout the advertisements. And so, you know, it's noteworthy to me. And I, and I started thinking back about this topic that we've hit a little bit before, which is autonomous vehicles. And there was this big promise that all these autonomous vehicles were going to come. And last summer, I even did an episode that kind of hit on this from a... 
I guess, a perspective of the micro forecast. I'll put a link in the show notes in case you missed that episode. I think it was in July of last year, where I was really talking about a variety of things that need these smaller area forecast. And, and autonomous vehicles would certainly be one of those things that would benefit from that. Where, and this even gets into the presentation I did at AMS, right? Where you're in places where there's not traditional measurements that are taken regularly throughout the day, but it's very relevant for a large percentage of the population that might be on the roads. And we've even had these, you know, these snow event that I mentioned a few weeks back that around the holiday season that trapped people, you know, for 100 plus miles on an interstate. And if you're going to have autonomous vehicles, the whole point of having that would be if you have these little micro forecasts, that data gets passed back stream so the cars know to, you know, plan for that or to adjust from that earlier in the process, ideally, right? That that real-time data gets shared. Now, hopefully, it would be shared from brand to brand and stuff. But that was the idea that I was talking about in that episode. And that's certainly relevant to... You know, these self-driving cars, if you will. But what about just electric vehicles in general? You know, what is the weather aspect of it? And in that context, what are the most important things to think about when it comes to weather and all these EV vehicles? Because clearly it's the push. There was that, with that much marketing and effort spent on it, there's no doubt that they're coming. I mean, the talk has been there for a while, but it seems more real than maybe it did two years or three years or five years ago. And and I have no doubt that some of this has to do with administration changes here in the U.S. and no doubt that some of it has to do with us coming out of COVID and people planning to drive more. But I think the, the emphasis is real. And so we get into, okay, well, how does, just in an EV standpoint, the weather relate to these things? Because again, if we get back to autonomous whether it's micro forecast or even if it's the impact on weather on those sensors. And, and I'll put another link in the show notes that kind of bridges that gap, right? It just talks about the challenges you have. Cause I, you know, I have a car, it's not an autonomous car, but there's these help components. And we've all in the last 10 years started to have them, the, the cameras that are in the back or, you know, kind of assist components. But as we try to bridge the gap, even whether it's autonomous or even to some assist components, sensors and how they interact with the weather is a big thing but even think about something as simple as the following you've got a a visual situation right and and some things are still based on visual so the ability to you know discern whether something is the road ahead versus a car versus a person all these things matter in in being able to deal with the matter now some of the sensors aren't visual acuity but seeing lines on the road are Okay, being able to, like I said, with when you have a snowy situation, you got contrast things. But even more fundamentally, I mean, it's like I started thinking about road salt and mud and things that can cover sensors. And again, different sensors are going to be impacted to a different level. But you start getting into this reality that just basic weather, even rain. When it when I'm driving down the road and it rains, some of the features I have just turn off, right? So this idea, let's say you've got cruise control, and that's not a new topic, right? You've got cruise control, which some level of autonomous in it. But over time, they've added this ability for cars to, it senses based on the car in front of you, so it slows down automatically without going out of cruise control, if you will. But when there's rain, that goes away. So there's a very real need to accommodate what could be extreme weather events, a blizzard, you know, blowing snow, or even in an environment like a very winter environment, because if you have a lot of snow, you lose the contrast, but even basic things, right? Even basic things like, you know, rain falling from the sky, or the idea of wind picking up debris and blowing debris. So maybe you're in a a more sandy climate. And if that in any way, and, and again, it it may not be a visual thing, but if there's enough of it to disrupt a sensor, you know, if it's, if sand, if it's sitting low on the car, for example, and sand's blowing across and getting in the way, it could impact the ability to leverage those things. And all that's interesting, right? And all that is, like I said, it kind of still bridges that gap to autonomous, but let's get more fundamentally into EVs. And what are we talking about with that? We're talking about something that, A, you've got to charge, and B, works on batteries, fundamentally, okay? 
So I started, you know, I've always kind of had this idea that, you know, these cars kind of like our phones. Now we put them on a pad and, and it just, it charges, right? And, and there's been a lot of talk for a long time about things being charged from the air, but it's no different. It could be in the ground too. I mean, when you drive a car today, it doesn't matter what kind of car, and you get up to stoplights, you've probably seen them before, those little cutouts. And, and what it is, is it's detecting a current. It's creating a current or brakes in a current so it knows to flip a traffic light that may not flip otherwise, okay? No reason why you're sitting at that same traffic light that that same technology couldn't be used to charge some of the batteries if they're designed that way. So there's real opportunity, and again, if you have snow on the road or other things on the road, rain on the road, those features may not work, but I think that's kind of minuscule in the thing of things, and I started digging a little more and thinking about it a little more and, and, and kept getting back this battery. You know, you don't hear much about water seeping into these batteries, stuff like that, because we've been working with them for a while now. Most of the battery technology that's in those have been in laptops and our phones and all those things, and we've worked really hard to better weatherize them. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, there still is a real issue that has to be compensated for with batteries, and that is the range at which that battery operates. There's a temperature zone. We get back to this fundamental thing. It's the same with humans, right? That temperature, a lot of times, is the biggest challenge. It's either our ability not to cool off, heat waves killing people, or just being exposed to cold. Okay, Bigger killers than all these drastic storms you hear about. It's quite often the temperature is the problem. And it's probably the same challenge for EVs. And I came across an article that covers this well, so I'm going to talk about the ideas in it. But if you want to read a little bit more, there's a link in the show notes so you can do that. And it's, it's fundamentally about this idea that batteries, when they get to, and, and each battery is going to be a little different, but, but imagine a range that's, I, you know, again, I'm going to talk Celsius here just because it's easier. It's how things are communicated from about negative 20 Celsius, which is going to be near, it's not exactly zero Fahrenheit, but uh, d just imagine in that vicinity to about 60 Celsius, which is about 140 Fahrenheit. And you're saying, okay, most people don't work in that. Well, no, that's just, that's an extreme of, they would r recommend not working outside of that. Okay. So in that context, you then got to go and say, okay, well, if those are the extremes, what do we have on either side of that? And does that just mean that the climate can't be that way? Or is there some way to heat up a battery? You know, you got to think about all those things. But actually, as you get outside of a narrow range, you really start to dissipate how much charge a battery can hold and whether you should even try to charge it. So there's a range, and they even talk about this, of you know, don't even try to charge your car if, if it's above a certain temperature or below a certain temperature. But even outside of that, you shouldn't discharge, okay, which is use the battery, if it's trying to do it outside of a certain range because it impacts the ability of the batteries to work and probably impacts the lifespan. And, you know, as we've heard, I mean, batteries can explode and those sort of things. And a lot of that, a lot of time that is driven by temperature changes, okay? Now, you may think, oh, it's not a big deal, but Imagine, okay, for a moment, you just live in a warm climate, right? And you're in a place that gets regularly near 100 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And all of a sudden, you're driving down the road and you're on hot pavement. So that immediately is going to bump that up. And this battery is operating. So in its operation, it's already generating heat. Now, a traditional car... That engine, an engine is actually creating more heat. It's one of the challenges, right? It's a combustible engine, creates heat in those explosions, if you will. But the systems have been developed and the antifreeze and all that and coolant, you know, keep things from getting frozen, keep things from overheating, have been developed around a system that has a much wider temperature range, okay, that it has to deal with. Now we've got batteries that have a much narrower range. And if you're driving down a hot road, those batteries tend to sit on the bottom of the car you know, near the base. So you, you start thinking about all the things that have to go into it. But at the end of the day, if you can't cool those batteries or keep them warm enough, it's a real issue. So this may be a reason, and, and I'm guessing that they've worked through some of these challenges, that we haven't seen EV adoption sooner. Sure, there's still the, the capability of charging. But as a commuter car, let's be clear, as a commuter car, if you're not driving very long distances, if you're just going to and from an office, there's no reason you can't take it to the office, come home, plug it in at your home, right? You should be just fine if that's your normal use case for a car. Now, there are a lot of people that still aren't that. And yes, we need to address that. But 
the reason you probably see a heck of a lot more Teslas than you used to is people recognize that it's pretty much that straightforward. But what are they doing to deal with this temperature issue? Well, the reality is it's not as, you know, it's, it's a lot like your car works today. So your car, when you have antifreeze slash coolant, particularly in coolant, is it's dissipating the heat through moisture or being against a liquid because liquid, as we all know, right? You ever taken a bath, right? And you know how quickly your temperature changes compared to when you're in air, okay? Of even the same temperature. Air is not a very good conductor of heat or cool of temperature, if you will. But liquids are. And they're, the Tesla cars, from what I can see as an example, have liquid cooling for those batteries for this very reason. And you can also, some of the original systems used air, so it was using air from maybe inside the car and passing that outside the car to you know, keep things at a, at a certain temperature range, or you can benefit from the outside air. But it's just like so many things. There's this sweet spot. But because there's this narrower temperature range, they really had to think about something different. And my speculation is the technology, what you really want to do is you want to keep those batteries in a tight range. Right. And we've been doing this with computers for a long time, generally speaking, but the focus has always been on the processor and how hot that processor gets. But anybody who's ever used a laptop or even your phone now, you've ever held your phone and watched a video and felt how hot it's gotten? Well, yeah, some of that's the processor, but some of it's actually the battery being used as a, at a higher rate of consumption than it was before. So a lot of that heat somehow needs to be compensated for. One, you don't want the thing to burn your hand because let's be clear, you don't want something that's even at 60 degrees in your, sixty degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit in your hand. You just don't, right? It's, it's pretty hot. But at the same time, you want to have all these things. So they have implemented some of those same technologies and I'm sure it will continue to advance. But at the end of the day, that's probably something, and it will continue to be the weather component. You, you, again, we hear about all these big weather issues, but it's going to be kind of the silent weather, if you will. The thing that just sort of happens every day, ups and downs, right? That's going to have the biggest impact on the ability to use EVs, how far we drive them, the, the climates where they can best be used. And, and again, it may be that EVs, that means you can't use them in very well in certain parts of the Middle East or, you know, in parts of Africa in, in desert regions where it gets hot or other areas that are like that. But it could also mean that, you know, there's challenges that you've got to compensate for models that are going to drive in, in colder climates as well. And it, and it may not be universal. I remember I had a, a friend when I was a kid who had a diesel car and he, when it was cold days, he had to go hit this little coil that warmed things up because the engine couldn't start if it was real cold. And you were probably going to run in the same thing with these EV vehicles. You may not know what's going on, but there's probably been a lot of design work very specifically developed around just keeping things in a certain temperature range. I don't know. I found it kind of interesting. I am curious, though, if any of you out there have been using an EV, again, get away from autonomous, but an EV vehicle at all, if you have found particular weather that's problematic for your vehicle, I don't. let me know. I, I'd be curious to know what is it about the weather at gmail.com. You can also get me on Twitter, Mark underscore Jelinek, or what is it about the weather on Twitter. Okay. I'd love to hear your stories and, and learn a little bit more about this. I find the topic interesting, but maybe I'm off base. Who knows? We'll find out. But just remember, in the meantime, the next time you plug in your car, if you're doing it now or if you're planning to in the new, near future, just remember, there's much more to weather than the weather itself. <laughs>